Statistics, Central Limit Theorem, CLT. Get ready and some coffee because if we want to get realistic, we need statistics. First question, why do I need to learn the Central Limit Theorem? Because of course it's important to statistics and we all want to do statistics. So why is the Central Limit Theorem important to statistics? It's the foundation of inferential statistics. So when we're thinking about a situation where we have a subset of a population, possibly a sample, we want to be able to run tests on that sample and make inferences applying what we know from the sample to the larger population. Remembering that as we do this, although this is a common scientific method, it doesn't give us absolute surety. It gives us an idea based on what we know that we can infer about the larger population. What we would like to be able to do is make those inferences as accurately as possible and possibly also be able to measure how accurate the inferences we have made are how much confidence can we have in the results that we have found in other words first a word from our sponsor yeah actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six pack shirts, a must have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man, you know. That CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. You know, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six pack like shape, which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. And, and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. The CLT, Central Limit Theorem, allows us to make inferences about population parameters like the mean, otherwise known as the average or middle point of a data set based on sample statistics, even when the population distribution is unknown. So in other words, we often want to find that middle point about a data set, such as like the average size of a person or the average height of people, the average size of like a worm or something uh, in nature. We might want to be looking at how many on average widgets are going to be a box of widgets that is produced from a manufacturing company, for example, which we can't test the entire population for, but might be able to take a sample and hope that that sample can give us some idea about that mean and possibly some idea about the confidence level around that. So normal approximation. The CLT justifies the use of the normal distribution and many statistical procedures, including hypothesis testing and the creation of confidence intervals. So these are the two common tools that we will use the two setups that we will typically have in a situation where we have a large population and we're trying to find information about that population by taking a subset or sample of that population we can then structure it as a uh, confidence interval situation or a hypothesis testing uh, type of situation Either way that we structure it, however, we're usually taking into account the concept and utilizing the idea of the central limit theorem that allows us to be using the bell-shaped curve, which we want to do because the bell-shaped curve has certain characteristics about it that we know well, and therefore it's going to be easier to use. Now, remember that not all data sets are going to have a bell shape. Some data sets do approximate a bell shape, but many do not. 
The idea with the central limit theorem is even if we have data that does not approximate a bell-shaped curve, it's skewed to the left, in other words, if we saw a histogram, or skewed to the right, or has a uniform uh, distribution, not a bell shape, then because of the central limit theorem, we might still be able to utilize the concepts of a bell-shaped curve, even with that type of data, which is quite practical and useful in real-world application. Real world applications, the CLT, Central Limit Theorem, is widely used in fields such as economics, medicine, engineering, and social sciences to draw conclusions about large populations from sample data. So this is a huge tool in all areas that we're trying to get more and more certainty about numerically, trying to apply, in essence, a scientific type of method, an inference method, which will not give us complete certainty but we're trying to get uh, as much data or make as best an approximation to give us information about how the real world works or is that we can. And this is going to be a huge tool for doing that in many different fields. So population versus the sample. A population is the entire group of individuals or observations, while a sample is a subset of the population. Now, most people envision when we hear the population, an actual group of people here, which might be our population if we're trying to take a poll or we're trying to say what the average height of the average person is within a particular population. But the population could also be anything. We could be sampling mole size. How long is a mole? How long is a worm? What's the average weight of a tick or something like that, right? So that could be our larger population. We're not going to be able to test every inchworm in the world to see what the average length of them are. Therefore, we're going to have to rely in some way, shape, or form on a sample that we can hope that we can apply the results to the larger population. Does that mean that there might not be some super huge inchworms out there that aren't really inchworms because they're bigger than an inch, obviously, or something like some giant worm. Possibly, you, you never know because we can't tell from an inference about the entire population, but based on the sample that we've seen, we can give an approximation of the sample size or the average you know, length of the worm, possibly, or something like that. That's the best we can do. That's our scientific method in many, many uh, fields. Sampling distribution of the sample mean. So the sampling distribution of the sample mean is the probability distribution of all possible sample means of a given sample size from a population. So here's kind of the trick. Here's kind of the key in order for us to be taking data which might not have a bell-shaped distribution and still be able to use a bell-shaped curve. And we'll see many examples of this. This is something that we have to kind of see in practice, I believe, running scenarios so we can really basically understand it. So the actual data points themselves, even if that is skewed to the left, skewed to the right in terms of a histogram or normally distributed, if we take the idea of the average or uh, of every or average or mean of every possible combination of sample of whatever sample size that we are taking, that information will tend towards a bell-shaped curve. Now, obviously, in practice, we can't actually take all possible combinations of samples. We might do an actual example of doing that uh, in another course or section if uh, just to get the concept of it. But conceptually, we can think of the two main things that we would need in order to graph a bell curve based on that information. We would need the center point, the, the, the middle mean, and we can approximate that with the sample. And we also need the standard deviation, which we can approximate with the standard deviation of the population or possibly the standard deviation of the sample as part of a formula. So we'll use a formula to give us basically the standard deviation that we're going to use for uh, the bell curve, which isn't actually the standard deviation of the population or of the sample, but rather is the standard deviation that we imagine to be the mean of all combination of samples. How do we get that formula? How do we derive the formula? Well, we can imagine running tests to look at the relationship between the standard deviation of the population and the standard deviation of all 
possible combinations, uh, mean of all possible combinations. And based on running those tests, based on looking at that relationship, we can come up with that formula that gives us that second key number that will allow us to use the bell-shaped curve. So once again, key component here, which we'll see a lot more in practice problem, sampling distribution of the sample mean. The sampling distribution of the sample mean is the probability distribution of all possible sample means of a given sample size from a population. So normality. As the sample size n increases, the distribution of the sample mean approaches a normal distribution. So what does normal mean for us here? We're looking at a normal curve. A bell-shaped curve is basically what we envision as, in essence, the normal curve where we have basically around 95% of the area under what we say two standard deviations of, uh, of, of the distance from the middle point is our general idea. And so as the sample size n, we name the sample size n increases, the distribution of the sample mean approaches uh, a normal distribution. So meaning as n goes up, we're gonna get closer to a normal distribution when we think about all possible combinations of the mean of sample sizes, right? And so, but it, it, there's a limit to it, meaning we don't have to keep on, up to a certain point, the data is gonna approximate a bell-shaped curve even if the actual data points weren't bell-shaped, the mean of all sample sizes will approximate a bell-shaped curve as we get larger sample sizes up to a certain point. And then again, the diminished will have diminishing returns beyond that point. Therefore, the general idea is going to be, well, if our sample size is very small, the central limit theorem may not have kicked in for us to properly utilize the bell-shaped curve. And therefore, we might switch, which we might talk about in a future course or section, from using a normal distribution to possibly T distributions. And if the sample size is small, we might want or hope or try to be working with data that actually is normally distributed rather than skewed to the left or skewed to the right. But as we get a larger sample size, and especially if we know the standard deviation of the actual population, then, then we're going to tend towards a bell-shaped curve and be able to use that normal distribution typically. So the mean, uh, the population mean, the standard deviation, the formula that we're going to be looking for is the standard, sometimes called sigma x bar, the standard deviation of all the combinations of the mean of all combinations is going to be the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So the population standard deviation divided by the square root of uh, the sample size. So this normal distribution will have the same mean as the population, but its standard deviation, often called the standard error, will decrease as the sample size increases as you can see because we have because of the formula square the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n so as n goes up then you're increasing the denominator so uh, that's going to be the 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 general idea so remember that most people when we get into these example problems the mean or average makes sense we want to have the middle point of say the bell curve we're looking for the middle point of the bell curve whether we think about the average as the average or middle point or mean of the population, which usually we don't know, or we have we think of it as the middle point of the sample, the middle point of the sample should tend towards the same middle point of the population. And then we can imagine the middle point of the mean of all possible uh, combinations of whatever sample size that we chose n. And again, that middle point should tend towards the same number the average or middle of the actual population data. It's the standard deviation that becomes an issue, which is the measure of the, the spread. So the measure of the spread is the other number that we need to, to plot the, the bell curve. And you have the standard deviation of the population, which we can figure out. But again, the population might not, not have a bell-shaped curve. And that's why we're not using the spread of the curve. We're using We're looking at the mean and then trying to look at at the, at the average of all possible combinations. 
then we have the standard deviation of the sample, which if we don't know the standard deviation of the population, we might use in the formula to calculate the, the, the standard deviation that we want, which you might call the standard error calculation. And then, and then you've got the standard error calculation, which is the standard deviation that we're going to use to plot the actual curve that we're going to be using. And again, the, hypo the idea of that is it's going to be the formula giving us the standard deviation as though we took the average of all possible uh, samples of whatever sample size uh, that we picked. Example, rolling a dice. So the population, suppose we roll uh, a fair six-sided die where uh, each outcome, one through six, has an equal opportunity. Sample size, if we roll the die five times, 30 times, and 100 times, and compute the mean of each sample, how will the distribution of these sample means look? So when we do a statistical kind of thing like rolling dice, oftentimes you might think of like the entire population as you know, an infinite times of rolling the dice. What do we expect to happen on average if we've rolled it like an infinite amount of times, right? And then we're taking the sample, meaning we're gonna, we're gonna do, we're gonna actually roll the dice a finite number of times. So what would we expect to happen when we roll the dice? Well, let's go through the step-by-step. Step. We roll the die multiple times, collect the sample means and plot them. So for small sample sizes, if we only roll it like five times, the distribution of the sample means will look somewhat irregular and skewed. So now we're gonna, we roll it five times, uh, we take the outcome, but we're looking once again at the distribution of the sample means. So as the sample size increases to 30, the distribution will start to resemble a bell-shaped curve. That's the point as we get to it. So, so remember when we're rolling dice, if we were just to roll one dice, and we're plotting all the data of one dice, you're gonna get not a bell-shaped curve, you're gonna get a normal distribution, tending towards a normal distribution. If we roll multiple dice and we're taking, uh, if we're taking the average, so so for small sizes, the dis we're taking the, the average of all samples. So now you're throwing the dice and you're taking, you know, the average of the sample and you did that multiple times, then when, once we start looking at that data, all of the averages of all of the samples, that data is going to start to tend towards a bell-shaped curve. And so, and that's what we're looking for. And then the question is, well, when does the central limit theorem kick in? How large, how many times do we have to do this in order for the data to tend towards a bell-shaped curve? And the general kind of thing is like, People will throw out like 30 as a number that we would have to clear, but it's going to be dependent in part on how skewed the data is. You would think, in other words, if you had a data set that's already normally distributed, say you're taking a data set about a machine that produces so many ounces of ketchup or something, you would expect that data set to be around a middle point and have a normal distribution, and therefore you might not need as high an, an N samples to get it to get it to be a bell-shaped curve but if you have something that's highly skewed to the left or the right you would think it would need to be larger so when the sample size reaches 100 or more the distribution of the sample means will be very close to the normal distribution regardless of the dices the dice original discrete uniform distribution all right example two heights of people Population, consider the height of people in a certain country, which may not follow a perfectly normal distribution. It could be skewed or bimodal. So meaning if we're looking at the heights of people, you might think the heights of people should tend towards a central point uh, and then be bell-shaped. And typically they would if they're from the same area or population. But normally that would be the case if we took all men versus all women. If we took the heights of everybody, you might get something that's 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 got two that's got two main peaks in it by because the heights of women on average are going to be tend to be slightly shorter for most places than the heights of men, right? So you might end up with a data set if you're taking heights that might not be normally distributed unless you took the heights of all men or women in a particular uh, area, right? 
So sample, suppose we take samples of uh, 50, 100, 1,000 people at random and calculate the mean height for each sample. For smaller sample sizes, the sample means might vary significantly as the sample size increases, the distribution of the sample means will become more normally distributed. So once again, if we took all of the data, if we took like one large sample or we took all of the population of data, it might not have a normal uh, distrib distribution. But if we take uh, the average of multiple samples, so if we take samples of sample sizes uh, of 50, 100, or 1,000, and then we take the average height of each of the samples, right, then you're going to have the average of the samples, and and that those numbers are the things that are going to tend more towards a uh, bell-shaped curve. And, but the larger the n, the sample sizes, then the more likely that you're going to get sample sizes that will be representative and will tend towards that bell-shaped curve is the general idea. Although, again, you don't want to be thinking that it's a one-to-one -one relationship and you can just keep on increasing the sample size and that will that will be the key to making your your outcomes better because you end up with diminishing returns after you reach a particular point, which is dependent in part on possibly the distribution of uh, the data set. So applications of the CLT, the central limit theorem, polling and surveys. When conducting surveys, st uh, statisticians use the central limit theorem to make inferences about the population based on a sample. For instance, polling 1,000 people can help predict election outcomes for an entire population. So notice that 1,000 people is not that many people, really, when you're talking about a very large population. And that's the idea of Basically, if you have a can of soup and you're trying to figure out how much salt is in it, you stir it up, you take a teaspoon, and you taste it. If you have a whole cauldron of soup that you're going to feed a castle with, then again, you stir it up and you take a, a large enough sample, a teaspoon or whatever, to see how salty it is. You're going to get diminishing returns once you go beyond too much beyond that uh, sample. If you drink a whole kettle of soup, you might not have a better idea of how much salty it is. You might have a little bit better idea, right? But if you taste a little bit of soup, if it's too small, then it's not going to kick in. Similarly here, if the sample sizes are too small, the central limit theorem uh, might not kick in. That's going to be a problem. As we increase the sample sizes, then that's going to give us more accurate data up to a point. And then it still might give more accurate data, but it's not going to give you a whole lot more bang for the buck. So quality control in manufacturing, the CLT helps assess whether a, sam a sample of products is representative of the entire population line ensuring quality standards are met. So any kind of uh, qual a line of production, whether it be all automated or an assembly plant of some kind or how many, how many uh, lettuce leaves are in a bag of lettuce or something, what's the weight of a bag of lettuce or something like that. Those are all things that we can use sampling for to try to test how accurate it is, which, of course, we're going to need to put on the box of the bag of lettuce or something like that, right? Finance and risk management. In finance, analysts use the CLT central limit theorem to predict the behavior of the stock prices or portfolio returns, which may not follow a normal distribution individually, but can be approximated as normal when aggregated. So obviously in finance, we, we use all, all kinds of statistical concepts are going to be used to try to get an idea of, of what's going to happen within the market. So common misconceptions. Central limit theorem, CLT, doesn't require normal populations. One of the most common misconceptions is that the CLT, central limit theorem, only applies to normally distributed populations. And there's been some talk, especially within finance, about about people that uh, when when uh, situations that can be kind of uncommon, where possibly the normal kind of statistical procedures might not give you the same the same types of predictions, like a, a long tail uh, distribution or something like that. But it doesn't; th those concepts don't take away from the general idea of uh, the central limit theorem, uh, which is going to be like a staple of 
testing many different things, even when the data is not going to be a normally distributed situation. In other words, you might say, hey, look, you can't use a normal distribution to be measuring this particular thing, because if you look at the scatter plot of the data, it's skewed to the left, it's skewed to the right, it has a normal distribution. If I roll a dice, uh, if I roll the dice and I try to see, you know, what the outcome of rolling a, a six-sided die is, I'm not going to get a normal distribution. I'm going to get a a uniform distribution. So, so how could you apply a bell-shaped curve to that? Doesn't make it right. Well, that's because the central limit is going to kick in, and we're thinking about the idea of us taking multiple samples, right? If we took if we took the the average the average of samples that have sample sizes over a certain amount, that's the data that's going to tend towards uh, the bell-shaped curve, which is a little wonky to kind of wrap your mind around, which is very useful to see in Excel or working practice problems. So we'll do that in a future course or section. In fact, the population distribution does not need to be normal, but the sample size must be sufficiently large. Sample size requirements. Some believe that any sample size is sufficient for the CLT to apply. However, while n greater than 30 uh, is generally rule, larger sample size may be required for highly skewed or heavily tailed distributions. So this is where kind of rules of thumb come into play. So generally, a lot of people will say, well, you need a sample size that's going to be sufficiently large. Otherwise, you might not use the normal distributions or you might use like a T distribution, which will give you a little bit of a fatter tail to kind of help you out to give you a little more uh, room for error. Uh, but still, uh, we, want, we, we want the central limit theorem to kick in. And so you might have a sample size of 30 is a general number that's thrown out oftentimes. But if the data is heavily skewed, then we might need sample sizes above that. So you can get into more detail and look at the what a size might be appropriate to make sure the central limit theorem kicks in depending on the type of data that you're looking at. So the shape of the sample distribution, the CLT applies to the distribution of sample means, not the distribution of individual data points. So again, when you roll that dice and you just look at the individual data points, it's not going to be a bell-shaped a bell curve. We're looking at the CLT applies to the distribution of sample means, meaning we're, we're taking the average of multiple samples. Now, again, in practice, we might not we might not even have multiple samples, right? We might still be doing one sample, but we're applying the concept as though we took we took all possible combinations of samples of whatever sample size. And you might say, well, how in the world can you do that? Well, because the middle point is going to be the same, even if it's if it's skewed data, we could still say this is going to be the average or middle point. And then we need the standard deviation which we can get from a formula, the formula being based in part on the standard deviation of the actual population or the approximation of that, the standard deviation of the sample. But the formula is going to convert that to the concept of all possible, the mean of all possible combinations of samples, right? So that's the, that's the, that's the key. How, so, so the sample distribution may still be skewed, but the distri distribution of the sample means will approach normality. So to summarize, so central limit theorem, as the sample size increases, the distribution of the sample mean will approach a normal distribution regardless of the population's original distribution. So you have an, a weird original distribution the central limit theorem will typically will still be useful, which again is huge. That's 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 a, a key component to almost all types of things that we think of scientific type of analysis where we're using inference. So key takeaways: the CLT allows the normal approximation and many uh, statistical procedures, meaning the use of the normal distribution, uh, the uh, a bell curve. Larger sample sizes lead to more accurate approximations of the population mean, but that's limited to, a, to some point, meaning we need to have sufficient sample sizes in essence for the central limit theorem to kick in to make sure that we should be able to use that normal distribution, which we have general rules for around 30 possibly, but 
we might need more detailed rules that could be based on what we think the approximation of the actual data is. Is it bell-shaped? Well, then maybe we don't need as high of a sample size given that it's already bell-shaped. If it, is it highly skewed one way or the other? Then you might need larger sample sizes to make sure the central limit theorem is effectively kicking in. The CLT, central limit theorem, is uh, foundational to hypothesis testing. Confidence intervals, those are the two main inference tools, which we'll talk more about later, and many other st statistical applications. So anytime we're trying to find information about a large population, and the only way to do that is to take some type of sample, which is going to include some kind of randomness with it, and then we're going to apply the findings found from the sample to the larger population, we're typically using the central limit theorem, bell-shaped curves in play.